Hi, everybody. Good evening for those who are in California and good morning um, for, I don't know if we have uh, participants joining from China. Welcome to our webinar. And today's webinar is, um, the topic is the strategies to decarbonize China's heavy duty freight and the potential for electrification. Before we um, introduce the two outstanding speakers, let me share some housekeeping items to make sure that we are aware of the um, agenda today and some uh, logistical items. So we have an hour today for the whole session, including the presentation and the discussion. And so for those who you would like to direct any questions after the presentation made by the speaker today, please enter them in the Q&A area on your screen at any time, actually during the presentation, you can also do that. Um, we'll try our best to answer them live. And you would also have access to the recording of the webinar 48 hours after we conclude today. So with that, Let's uh, welcome our two distinguished speakers, Dr. Nanjo, who is the staff scientist, head of the International Energy Analysis Department and a lead of the China Energy uh, Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Dr. Zhou is the US Director of the US China Clean Energy Research Center, Building Energy Efficiency, CERC B, and she has a um, more than 10 years, uh, it's, it's at more than 10 year presidential level research based consortium of the US and China. Also, Dr. Zhou is a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. Um, and there are many achievements of Dr. Zhou that I wouldn't read um, them one by one tonight. And the other speaker is Nina Kanan. Uh, Nina is the Senior Scientific Engineering Associate, China Energy Group and um, also at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. For today, both Nan and Nina, I believe Nan will give us an introduction about the project first, and then Nina will have a presentation for us, which will be sharing those key findings and modeling results of a recent report that they've done. And the report will explore um, potential strategies for decarbonizing China's heavy duty um, freight sector with a focus on the potential impacts of electric and hydrogen fuel cell technology. Um, I will get out of your way and uh, hand the floor over to Nan for the introduction of the project. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Hello? Okay, yes, so thanks to Fan for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm very honored together with my colleague Inina Kana and to have this opportunity to talk about the recent study we just completed and the report uh, and it will be published soon on the strategies to decarbonize China's heavy duty freight and the potential for electrification. Okay, next please. Yes, yeah, just a little bit of introduction of uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, where we work and is a, a laboratory managed by UC uh, and University of California and also for uh, the Department of Energy in the US. And the mission of the lab is to bring science solutions to the world to solve the most pressing and profound scientific problem facing humankind. And that's where we identify climate change is the most critical problem, one of the critical problems. And also the environment is another. And in within this problem, I think we think this heavy duty trucking industry is one of the harder to abate sector that we would like to also uh, focus on. The lab has uh, and uh, uh, built a lot of uh, world-class scientific facilities and also uh, has the mission to train next generation of scientists and engineers. And here you can see the total budget. Uh, we have more than 3,000 employees and uh, uh, 13 Nobel Prize 
and uh, a lot of uh, all these great accomplishments in the past. Next, please. A little more introduction of uh, the China Energy Group, where uh, and uh, both Nina and I work in. It's funded in 1988. Uh, have, we have collaborative work with uh, the Chinese colleagues for 30 years. Um, currently, it has more than 12 staff members, including scientists and also other uh, staff members. And in the past 30 years, and we have worked with many institutions, think tanks, uh, academia, industry associations in China uh, on many uh, and projects and that delivered uh, all kinds of accomplishment and including the ones uh, and for appliance efficiency standards, but also for industrial energy efficiency. Yes, so that's a quick introduction. A little bit of background for this particular project and Nina will be and uh, talking about. Um, it is a um, Natural Research Defense Council, China uh, and uh, funded the project under this oil cap uh, program. And with the goal of identifying key solutions, both technologically and the policy, and to decarbonize the transportation sector and to cap the oil consumption. And um, particularly with a focus on and heavy duty trucking industry. So um, without too much and uh, delay, I would like to hand over to Nina and to talk more about this project, a little more objectives and also the findings. Okay, Nina, you have the floor. Thank you, Nan, uh, and for the introduction and thank you to Dr. Fun Dai and CCCI for giving us the opportunity to present our work. Let's see, and for co-hosting this seminar. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so today I'll be happy to introduce our recently finished analysis that we just completed of some near and um, mid-term and long-term strategies for decarbonizing China's heavy-duty trucking fleet from now out to 2050, including evaluating the potential for electrification through uh, both um, electric, battery electric, as well as fuel cell truck technologies. But before I begin to introduce our work, I really wanted to help um, un help everyone understand why we think our work is important and timely and to do that by contextualizing our analysis in terms of some recent policy and market developments that have evolved to support the decarbonization of heavy duty trucks. Then I will talk a little bit more about the specific um, strategies as well as technologies that we evaluated that can be deployed in the near term as well as some of the newer emerging electrification technologies that we see as uh, a possibility for the longer term. Then I'll introduce our bottom-up modeling and scenario analysis that we use to evaluate the potential um, energy as well as CO2 emission impacts of the strategies and technologies we evaluated and end with some policy implications and key findings based on our analysis. So as many of you probably know, in the last few years, there have been a growing number of policy drivers, both within China and also globally, that is making reducing transport CO2 emissions particularly important. Under the Paris Climate Accord, China committed to peak its CO2 emissions by 2030 or earlier. And over the last few years, China is steadily making progress towards meeting its domestic goal of reducing its CO2 per unit of GDP by 18% from 2016 to 2020, and is currently in the process of setting its CO2 intensity reduction goals for the next five years under the 14 five-year plan. Then more recently, um, in late September 2020, President Xi Jinping pledged that China would achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Since this is such a new target or that's been announced, um, the specific definition of carbon neutrality is, to, is still to be determined, but nevertheless, by announce, making this announcement, 
um, is quite an ambitious target for China and really puts a lot of pressure in terms of reducing economy-wide economy CO2 emissions. And if we turn to look at why transport is important within this context, although the transport sector in China currently only consumes about 10% of energy, it is one of the largest consumers of oil in China, um, accounting for more than half of oil consumption. And this is important not only in terms of China's future efforts to phase out fossil fuels, including oil, but also particular has important energy security implications as China has um, been a oil importer and continues to import a vast majority of its uh, oil consumption. So given this background, China has actually already made a lot of effort in terms of reducing uh, CO2 emissions from its transport sector, particularly in the light duty passenger vehicle market. So beginning in the late 2000s, uh, China introduced subsidy programs for what are known as new energy vehicles, which are now more recently defined to include battery electric, plug-in electric, and fuel cell vehicles. So the policy started with some subsidy programs for pilot cities and then gradually expanded to a national level subsidy program in 2013. And since then, the central government has spent upwards of 200 billion RMB or about uh, 30 billion US dollars on subsidies at the national level. And they've also been supporting subsidies at the subnational level to complement the national subsidies. And as a result of um, these policy pushes, we can see from the chart on the left that the sales of light duty new energy vehicles has really taken off in the last um, five or six years. So from 2014, it's grown rapidly uh, through 2018. And this includes uh, primarily battery electric vehicles, but also uh, other new energy vehicles such as fuel cell vehicles. At the subnational level, there's also been a lot of um, exciting efforts taken to be more ambitious in terms of pushing for these new energy vehicles. So the southern city of Shenzhen has um, committed to a 100% target for electrifying its municipal fleet back in 2005 and through additional municipal subsidies and other supporting policies and infrastructure development, Sunzin was actually able to reach its goal with 100% electrified municipal bus and taxi fleet in late 2017. And also recently, the southern island province of Hainan uh, has announced a 2030 ban on new sales for cars of um, petrol and diesel cars. So these two specific examples uh, represent a lot of uh, you know, more ambitious some national efforts that are taking place in China in addition to the national efforts to promote new energy vehicles um, in the light duty passenger market. So given the success in the light duty sector, we really wanted to understand if China's success in electrifying light duty transport was replicable for decarbonizing its heavy duty trucking sector through our study. And we think this is really important um, and a difficult question to answer because globally heavy duty trucks have uh, been traditionally very difficult to decarbonize because of its operational characteristics and also um, the pace of current technology development. But more also very importantly is that heavy duty trucks contribute disproportionately to significant um, air pollution as well as CO2 emission. So although they only account for about 10% of the global vehicle stock, they contribute 40% of transport sector CO2 emissions and uh, also account for more than half of uh, particulate matter and nitrogen oxide emissions in both the US and China. Um, if we turn to look at specifically air pollutants such as PM 2.5 emissions um, in China, we can see that actually heavy duty trucks can be emitting one to two orders of magnitude higher emissions than light duty vehicles. And this has really important implications for China given its recent um, concerns and challenges with uh, air quality, particularly in the urban areas. Um, and also, of course, all of the health uh, implications related to the air quality challenges. And for heavy duty trucks, they're also very um, 
difficult to decarbonize and reduce CO2 emissions because of how they're used in that they travel much longer distance than your typical light duty passenger vehicles, um, you know, up as much as 150 to 200,000 kilometer per year in China for specific vehicle types. And they also are operated for much longer periods of time and more frequently than light duty passenger vehicles. So this also contributes to the much higher emissions of both CO2 and air pollutants. From an energy perspective, um, Heavy duty trucks are also important because they've historically been the least efficient vehicles due to their much heavier weight and also larger loads. And in fact, energy efficiency standards for heavy duty trucks specifically uh, currently only exist in six countries, including China, US, India, Japan, and Canada. And all of these uh, efficiency standards were developed within the last 15 years. So this shows that there's still a lot more that can be done in terms of improving uh, efficiency of heavy duty trucks uh, globally and also within China. So if we took, take a look at what's happening in the roll freight sector or in the freight sector in China domestically, we can see that uh, roll freight has grown significantly in recent years. And the growth has been driven both by China's rapid economic growth that's happened in the last um, over last two decades, but also by things such as uh, China's entry into the WTO and its increased industrial and manufacturing activity, both domestically and also for global trade. We can see from the chart on the left that since you know the mid 2000s, there's been a significant increase in domestic freight transport uh, turnover activity, and this is primarily driven by increase in the road sector. So by 2018, the road sector accounted for nearly half of all of the freight goods that's being transported within China. And unlike uh, many developed countries such as US, the rail system in China is pretty constrained despite kind of new capacity uh, expansions because historically the railway system has been designated and prioritized for passenger transport and also the transport of national strategic materials um, such as heavy uh, industrial products and energies, um, energy fuels such as coal. So this suggests that the rural freight sector will likely continue to grow with very limited room uh, for shifting towards the rail sector. Within the road um, freight sector, we can see that of all the trucks, essentially, the heavy duty trucks, which is officially defined in China as trucks that have a gross vehicle weight of more than 14 tons, their share of the entire trucking fleet has uh, increased quite significantly over the last two decades, from 18% in 2002 to 28% in 2018. And in absolute terms, uh, the number of heavy duty trucks has increased by fivefold during the same period. And essentially the heavy duty trucks, um, the growth is offsetting declines in the mini and medium duty trucks, which are being uh, slowly kind of pushed out of the trucking fleet in China. So if we dig a little bit deeper and look specifically at the heavy duty vehicle market in China, we can see that most of the vehicle types that are commonly used um, in terms of heavy duty trucks include uh, heavy, include the tractor trailer trucks that are commonly used, um, including in the US. And these are the larger trucks that travel on long distance fixed routes um, and are transporting large quantities of uh, goods. So they can travel um, for anywhere from 150 to 200,000 kilometers per year. And they account for about 40% of the heavy duty truck fleet in China. The other large uh, truck type in heavy duty trucks in China is uh, what's called special trucks. And these are essentially smaller trucks within the heavy duty classification that are mostly used within cities um, for logistics travel and they travel a little bit shorter distance than tractor trailers. So combined these two account for more than 80% of heavy duty trucks. And so our analysis primarily focus on uh, tractor trailers, um, and special trucks, uh, since those are more representative of the entire heavy duty fleet market. 
So if we turn to look at the policies, um, as I mentioned earlier, China has already launched a lot of policies to support uh, decarbonizing the light duty passenger sector, but actually in recent years, there's also been growing policy support for decarbonizing heavy duty trucks in particular. So the national fuel economy standards were first introduced for heavy duty trucks in 2011, and more recently uh, entered stage three in 2019 with additional 15% improvement in the efficiency requirements um, from the previous stage. At the same time, there have also been regional and city level targets and subsidies for phasing out diesel vehicles, uh, since those are kind of the heavier polluting vehicles, and also increasing number of policies um, and regulations to support new and new trucks, including increased government focus on uh, R&D and manufacturing, uh, introduction of national development subsidies for these new energy trucks, since 2015, that was most recently extended to 2022, and also a host of different preferential uh, policies such as taxes, rights to drive on roads, parking fee waivers, um, you know, access to free charging poles for new energy trucks specifically. So there continues to be a lot of government focus on um, heavy duty trucks uh, technology development, including R&D and also manufacturing of key materials, components and core technologies. <laughs> At the same time, however, China also faces uh, several unique challenges to decarbonizing its heavy duty truck sector, including its unique uh, market structure and business model and some supply chain issues. So China's unique in that in the heavy duty trucking sector, there's an individual ownership model um, where more than 70% of truck owners essentially own their own vehicles with the individual owners owning an average of only three vehicles um, and nearly half of those truck drivers operating independently instead of working for a larger logistics company. Um, so with many you know, scattered smaller trucking operators, this results in decentralized decision-making that makes uh, policies to promote new energy vehicles a bit more difficult. And also these smaller trucking operators tend to be more risk averse on experimenting with new technologies such as new energy vehicles, uh, because they're worried that investing in newer technologies could hurt their day-to-day -day operations um, and essentially hurt their income source. And so at the same time, because these uh, owners are independent owners, a lot of the times the purchases of new trucks are actually financed through loans and debts and sometimes personal loans and debts. So this also makes the independent truck operators very sensitive to the higher upfront costs of uh, new energy vehicles for heavy duty trucks. And in fact, the cost of newer um, trucks are you know, typically four to five times the average driver's income. So this has a large impact as they're making the decision on which types of trucks they wanna purchase. On the manufacturing side, there's a, a similar story. Uh, for the tractor trailer market, it's uh, kind of different in that it's relatively consolidated with five large domestic manufacturers accounting for most of the tractor truck um, manufacturing market, but the market for other supporting components such as the trailers for the tractor trailers and also other specialty trucks are very fragmented with many small and scatter manufacturers that tend to be lower quality because they're smaller. Um, and this market fragmentation really makes it harder for these smaller manufacturers to invest in R&D of newer technologies because they have fewer vehicles for the manufacturer to spread the cost over. There are also other institutional challenges with transitioning from administrative approach to market-based policies. And also um, we see potential uh, implications in terms of resource and supply chain constraints, given the recent uh, increase in global demand for critical materials to support the transition to renewables. So related directly to the electrification story is what's happening in China's power sector during this time period. So as um, many of you probably heard in the news, China has rapidly expanded its renewable capacity in recent years, but coal currently still accounts for two thirds of the electricity generation in China. 
And so we've done analysis looking at what could happen um, in the future given the declining costs of renewables. And we do expect coal to be phased out of China's power generation over time, accounting for potentially as less as 5% um, of the total generation by 2050. But really the question is, um, is this power sector decarbonization happening fast enough given existing challenges that remain with power market reform and also integration of renewables. Um, and we'll see later in the modeling results that actually decarbonizing heavy duty trucks is very sensitive to the pace of decarbonization in the power sector. So in light of all these developments, we really wanted to focus on kind of doing quantitative analysis and forward-looking analysis to understand different pathways for decarbonizing China's heavy duty trucks. So we evaluated both short-term strategies that can be deployed readily uh, right now, including different, uh, different measures for improving efficiency, switching to commercially available liquefied natural gas or LNG trucks, and also systemic improvements in operation and logistics. For the mid and longer term, we wanted to evaluate the potential for electrification by looking at different uh, electrification technologies that exist today, including primarily battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell trucks. And for these technologies, we wanted to understand you know, what are the current uh, latest techno-economic um, trends and also what are some of the largest barriers to their large scale deployment and the potential for scalability over time. And we did this by both talking to interview, um, interviewing experts, uh, doing, um, you know, looking at the latest reports and papers that have been published, uh, doing techno-economic analysis, and also a major component was doing bottom-up modeling to understand the different pathways and the potential uh, emission reductions associated with those. And from our modeling analysis, we were able to draw out some policy and program implications um, in terms of the, both energy and emission, and also in terms of um, oil consumption. So first we evaluated the short-term strategies of efficiency improvement, including um, switching to LNG trucks and also operation and logistics improvement. Some of the key technologies for improving heavy duty truck efficiency include advanced engine technologies and also using high, high strength steel and aluminum for lightweighting uh, heavy duty trucks in China that are already quite heavier than comparable global trucks elsewhere. There are also measures uh, in terms of improving aerodynamics and also adopting low rolling resistance tires that improves overall truck efficiency. Another option is switching from diesel trucks that dominate the market now to LNG trucks, which only have a 2% share in the Chinese market uh, currently. But LNG trucks um, actually have advantages in that they provide a comparable fuel range and also comparable performance as diesel, diesel trucks. And the upfront price, differential, uh, price differential is quite small, especially when you take into consideration more stringent emission C standards that are being introduced in China. And they become actually quite competitive over a life cycle when the fuel savings are accounted for. Another component of the short-term strategies that we looked at was uh, freight operations and logistics improvement. And this is particularly important in China because as I mentioned, individual ownership model that exists uh, in China and the lack of consolidation in freight operations has really led to challenges with overloading and underloading. Um, and essentially there's uh, suboptimal operations and logistics resulting from this lack of consolidation in the market. So we identify some key areas with low to moderate uh, implementation barriers, such as um, using GPS and GIS to optimize dispatch and delivery routes, platooning, which is linking two or more trucks in a convoy with automated driving support systems to improve vehicle operational efficiency, providing driver training programs and feedback devices to help promote more fuel efficient driving behavior, backhauling by delivering cargo and return trips, which needs coordination across shippers um, and with better fleet and logistics management practices, and also co-loading by bundling shipments with similar characteristics across product categories so that economies of scale can be achieved. 
Then we looked at um, different emerging technologies that could be deployed in the mid to long term um, and essentially help electrify the heavy duty truck fleet in China. So first we looked at battery electric trucks since those are um, becoming more popular in the, even in the heavy duty trucking sector. But we can see that there's still quite um, some technical uh, challenges in terms of the performance and operational characteristics of heavy duty trucks that makes it a bit more difficult to electrify. This includes a heavier weight and larger vehicle sizes of the trucks, as well as the more rugged operations of the trucks compared to your light duty passenger vehicles. And as I mentioned before, the heavy duty trucks also travel much longer distance, so they have greater need for longer range and also uh, are operated for longer periods of time. So these driving characteristics means that batteries such as lithium iron batteries are needed for battery electric trucks um, of the heavy duty size require much higher energy capacity on the order of 10 times greater than electric cars. And they also have to have batteries that are much more durable and can withstand degradation through many more discharge cycles than your typical light duty um, passenger uh, cars and even light duty trucks. In terms of cost, there's um, the, some of the latest studies present a wide range uh, in terms of the estimate for costs, ranging from 175 to 375 uh, dollars per kilowatt hour for just the battery, um, as well as additional investment that's needed for infrastructure. And the battery cost is expected to de decline over time, with uh, many studies projecting. Uh, you know, 100 US dollar per kilowatt hour for the batteries um, by 2030. But of course, there's still a lot of uncertainties in terms of this projection. Um, and there's still, uh, besides cost, there's still a lot of other important barriers in terms of, as I mentioned, the limited range and capacities, the longer charging time that's needed for heavy duty trucks, as well as the general issues with charging infrastructure development. The other major electrification technology we looked at was hydrogen fuel cell truck. Um, in terms of where hydrogen is being produced uh, from in China, uh, most of the hydrogen being produced is actually coming from natural gas. About 76% is coming from natural gas through met methane reforming, while 23% is coming from electrolysis uh, from coal in China currently. But of course, um, the hope is to increase the percent that's coming from electrolysis and particularly from electrolysis uh, from renewables so that it can be a clean hydrogen. In terms of costs, um, there are significantly higher upfront costs for your fuel cell trucks, as well as for the fuel itself, but those are expected to decline over time as well, um, declining by 2030. Um, but there's also quite significant infrastructure costs for the hydrogen refueling station. Um, and, and one of the key barriers is also kind of standardizing the transportation distribution networks that are needed to support these stations. Um, and also having the low renewable electricity prices that would make um, electrolysis from renewables uh, competitive for hydrogen production. So this table uh, shows uh, some of the recent models that's been introduced for both battery electric and fuel cell trucks across the different classes. And if we only look at um, class eight and above, which is what we're calling the heavy duty trucks, we can see that most of the truck models today have range of less than 500 miles, um, except for the Tesla Semi and Nikola One, which is a fuel, fuel cell truck. But there are many more models in production or with anticipated production um, for battery electric trucks than fuel cell trucks. Um, and for battery, product, for battery electric trucks, this includes both common global manufacturers, but also some startups. And then for fuel cell trucks, um, the most common uh, prototypes are the Hyundai, Hyundai Exxon and the Nikola One. So we can see that the market is still evolving and developing in terms of where the technology is um, and commercialization of these technologies. So next we'll look at the modeling analysis we did and some of our key findings. Um, you know, taking into consideration all of what we found out about the technology development, the status of the market, we wanted to use our bottom-up uh, end-use model called the China 20. 
50 dream model to essentially do um, different scenario analysis to look at different possible pathways for reducing heavy duty truck CO2 emissions, um, whether it's short term strategies or these newer technologies that are slowly being rolled out. And so our model is really based on a bottom up approach that uses the Kaya identity where we um, calculate energy consumption as a function of activity levels and energy intensity. And by tracking the consumption of different fuels, we're able to calculate the CO2 emissions uh, associated with these different technologies. And we have a very detailed transport sector where we specifically model heavy duty trucks uh, by itself. And we have a stock turnover model that allows us to project the sales and fleet turnover of heavy duty trucks, um, tracking the different fuel types of trucks there are. And then in terms of scenario analysis, we change key input parameters, uh, such as activity, efficiency, or fuel share, to represent different pathways or scenarios that we believe could happen. Not necessarily what would happen, but what could happen. And these scenarios include a reference scenario where there's slow incremental uh, efficiency improvement and some field switching based on kind of historical trends and market pace of development. But then we also introduced our short-term strategy scenario with a full adoption of technical efficiency improvements um, and also faster adoption of uh, LNG trucks, including 50% share by 2050, and also a uh, reduction in heavy duty freight activity as a result of operation and logistics improvements. Then we introduced two uh, new energy vehicle adoption scenarios for heavy duty trucks, given kind of the uncertainties around their possible rollout. We had an early scenario where we looked at earlier and accelerated deployment of um, battery electric and fuel cell trucks starting in the 2020 and 2035 respectively, reaching 30 and 10% respectively. And then also a late adoption scenario with a slower deployment that happens later in the case of fuel cell trucks um, and reaching lower shares by 2050. So next we turn to look at our modeling results. So these two charts show the diesel consumption or the final energy demand um, under our two scenarios. And we can see under the reference scenario of development, diesel consumption will grow through the mid 2020s and by 2050 will remain above current levels. But if we implement short-term strategies of efficiency, switching to LNG trucks and also improving the operation and logistics, then we can see that alone can help diesel peak around the mid 2020s and fall below uh, 2015 levels by 2030. And by 2050, the diesel consumption would be only about half of what's being consumed by heavy duty trucks right now. If we expand um, and dig into the specific strategies that we kind of included in our short-term strategy scenario, we can see that energy efficiency improvement has the most significant reduction potential for final energy demand and followed by, uh, followed by logistics and operations improvement in the blue dotted line. And then we can see that switching to LNG trucks actually increases total energy use slightly because of the lower energy content of LNG with um, 1.67 LNG gallons essentially offsetting one gallon of diesel. So this leads to a slight increase in the final energy consumption as shown by the dotted green line compared to the black line. Then if we look specifically at natural gas, we can see that for natural gas demand, fuel switching to more energy intensive LNG trucks will increase the overall or net uh, natural gas demand as shown by the black solid line here and really offset reductions from improvements in efficiency and logistics improvement um, that's shown by the blue and gray bars. And actually by 2030, the net increase in natural gas demand is quite significant um, on the order of uh, 10 million tons of oil equivalent or the equivalent of uh, about one third of the natural gas that's being consumed under the reference scenario. If we look at the impact of all the strategies on diesel demand, then we can see that as shown by the red solid line, which represents short-term strategies, the three short-term strategies combined 
can reduce diesel use by about half compared to our reference scenario in 2050. And actually diesel consumption can peak and plateau in the early 2020s. Individually, the energy efficiency improvement have the largest potential as we mentioned before, and that alone can help um, diesel consumption peak in the early 2020s. The delay and slower adoption of new energy vehicles uh, can contribute an additional 14% reduction in diesel by 2050. But if the new energy vehicles are introduced earlier and achieve a larger share of the heavy duty truck fleet market in 2050, then uh, combined they can reduce 94% of the diesel that's consumed in 2050 during the reference scenario. So this shows that you know, combining short-term strategies with these new energy vehicle deployments in the longer term, that very significant um, diesel consumption, diesel reductions can be achieved uh, by 2050. And we can see that the new energy vehicles really start to have an impact on reducing diesel consumption um, in the later years compared to the short-term strategies in the earlier years. So if we break out the diesel reductions by individual strategy, we can see that efficiency improvement has the greatest potential in the near term through the mid 2030s. And then fuel switching to LNG has um, additional potential in the later years as more LNG trucks enter the market. There's also additional reductions from switching to new energy vehicles that become more apparent in the mid to late 2030s when the adoption begins to take off. And then really in the later years, it's switching to LNG and the new energy vehicle technologies that will have uh, the greatest potential in reducing diesel demand. If we turn to look at CO2 emissions, um, we can see that the short-term strategy shown by the red line alone can help peak CO2 emissions from heavy duty trucks as early as 2025. And then in 2030, if we just look at 2030 as a snapshot, we can see most of the CO2 reductions is also coming from energy efficiency improvement, followed by logistics and operations improvement, um, with a slight increase in LNG fuel switch uh, as a result of the LNG's higher energy intensity that actually offsets um, reductions in emission factors. And if we look at all of the strategies, um, in terms of the CO2 emission impacts, we can see that surprisingly, adoption of new energy vehicle technologies will not achieve CO2 reductions before 2045. And this is really because prior to 2045, the adoption of new energy vehicles actually increases instead of decreases uh, total CO2 emissions because the average CO2 emission intensity of the new energy vehicle trucks are higher than that of a diesel truck. And this is noteworthy because as I shown earlier, we already assumed a pretty fast um, decarbonizing power sector in China, but still it isn't until 2045 that these new energy vehicle trucks are really able to have a net reduction impact on CO2 emissions. But by 2050, the adoption of new energy vehicles will result in net CO2 emission reductions um, because the power sector is much more decarbonized. And we can see that adopting new energy vehicles earlier versus later will have a greater CO2 reduction benefit because there's higher shares of battery electric and fuel cell trucks by 2050 if the adoption starts earlier. And compared to the strategies that were undertaken in the short term, early adoption of NEVs actually has the second largest CO2 emission reduction potential in 2050. So based on our findings, um, we really found that it's important to develop policies and programs that support a diverse mix of technical solutions to mitigate CO2, as well as broader environmental impacts um, that of a heavy duty fleet that's currently dominated by diesel. And to achieve the maximum CO2 reduction and as well as diesel reductions, decarbonizing heavy duty trucks really needs to rely on a mix of near and long-term strategies, as well as multiple technologies instead of a single new energy vehicle technology, for example. And while the existing technical improvements, efficiency and switching to LNG in the near term um, can help 
there really needs to be additional policy support happening very quickly to accelerate the research and development of NEV technologies um, and also to provide the infrastructure that's needed. And this includes both public-private partnerships for siting infrastructure development as well as investment in the basic technologies to support the development and commercialization of these uh, battery and fuel cell technologies. And some longer term strategies that we think can help address existing barriers um, for NAVs to enter the market include supporting key technology innovation, um, increasing the understanding of electric trucks through driver experience, a uh, driver through direct user experience to help reduce uh, driver anxiety with new technologies, promoting manufacturer designs that are easy to operate and maintain to make the transition smoother, and also really focusing on constructing infrastructure for charging and battery replacement facilities and adopting policies and programs to increase the convenience and economics of uh, charging and refueling. So in summary, we found that existing technical improvements in efficiency and uh, readily available LNG trucks can lead to sizable diesel and CO2 emissions reductions in the near term, with diesel possibly peaking as early as 2025 for heavy duty trucks. We found that scaling up the adoption of battery electric and fuel cell trucks have very similar final energy demand and CO2 emission reduction impacts. Um, including a net increase in CO2 through 2045, but can displace diesel demand and lead to CO2 emission reduction in the later years. We also saw that if NVE trucks are adopted earlier under our early adoption scenario, then there would be greater annual CO2 emission reductions on the order of more than 100 million tons of CO2 per year compared to later adoption that happens slower. And overall, we believe that policies and programs are needed to support the diverse mix of solutions, including um, to reduce diesel and CO2 emissions from heavy duty trucks, including R&D for new energy vehicle technologies and investment in charging infrastructure. So with that, I just wanna again, acknowledge our funder and also um, our co-authors, including um, both Nan and also Hong Yo Lu, who's on the line today, and our other colleague, David Fritley and my contact information is here as well. Thank you for your time and attention. Great, thank you so much, Nina, for your presentation. I found it quite helpful and really informative. So um, I think we have a few minutes left here for some questions from the audience. And um, I think for, um, any of those you have questions, you might want to put in the Q&A box so that we could see those questions and um, have Nina and, and Nan try to answer those for you. And before we jump into that, um, I might take the advantage of being the moderator tonight and ask my own question. So I think Nina, that's uh, really, really helpful for me to just to learn from this uh, whole study that the decarbonization potential in in China's heavy duty uh, vehicle sector. I wonder, I know in California, uh, recently Governor Newsom had this executive order which um, demands the, um, not only the passenger vehicles, but also trucks um, sell in California to be 100% uh, zero emission vehicles by 2035. Wonder how do you see that kind of a target being, uh, if it's you know, replicable in China, or you know, feasible as you see now China has already uh, announced its carbon neutrality uh, target, which is uh, 2060. I wonder how you see that in terms of a uh, possibility. And also a question for Nan is, I know you've been leading the uh, CERC building for um, many years, and now we have uh, uh, the president-elect Biden and hopefully with his uh, climate agenda that uh, working with China on climate, and especially when we're talking about electrification of the transportation sector, might be you know, one of the topics um, on the policy agenda. How do you see that kind of collaboration moving forward between the two countries, especially when we're talking about um, heavy duty vehicles in the transportation sector? 
So maybe Nina, you want to go first? Sure. Thanks for the question. Yes. So I think there's been um, you know some discussion of the possibility of setting targets um, for China for I guess both the passenger vehicles as well as for the heavy or trucks um, and maybe particularly for heavy duty trucks as well. Um, I think it's a pretty common approach that um, China's used in the past in terms of setting kind of a national target um, for you know, electrifying or introducing you know, new energy vehicle technology. So I think it's definitely possible. And I can see that there are advantages in terms of you know, sending a very clear signal um, and providing guidance to the manufacturers um, for doing that. I think we would just caution that um, you know, in terms of deciding on the targets to really consider the current state of the technologies and also to try not to pick a particular technology, um, you know, not to set a particular target for for example, for battery electric or for fuel cells, since I think both technologies are still being developed. Um, and as I mentioned, each have its own kind of disadvantages and advantages. Um, so it is helpful, I think, to set a overall target um, in terms of driving the market and providing uh, push for the market for the manufacturing also on the demand side. And at the same time, I think there can also be a lot of um, subnational action or even subnational targets. And that's also another approach that China has taken in the past in terms of, you know, using pilots to test out whether it's targets um, or other measures to kind of accelerate the market entry of certain technologies in a smaller market and then kind of scaling up from there. So I think that's also another approach that's been discussed in terms of helping advance electrification um, of transport and particularly for the trucking sector. And then I'll turn it over to Nan for the second part of your question. Um, okay, yeah, so um, actually I noticed uh, Michael Wang and from and uh, Argonne National Lab is also on the line and he actually is a uh, um, and seek a deputy director for this uh, CERC program, um, particular electric vehicles. So he may have um, like insights to offer as well. Um, but I just want to quickly mention, yes, I think definitely that will be a key area for the US and China to work together. Um, and China has been known and to have these uh, scaling up and uh, capabilities by its manufacturing, uh, by its government um, and the programs for demonstration. And so both at the local level and the national level, and also their ability to roll out and uh, regulations and also uh, a lot of time they're mandatory and also targets such as this 100% uh, uh, new energy vehicle for government fleet or taxis and buses, all of those. And uh, so, um, and then we see similar effort uh, on the solar PV and the China contributed quite a bit bringing, helping uh, bring the cost down uh, for the global deployment. So something similar for the transportation, transportation sector uh, could follow that trend. Um, and uh, we could see, and the, you know, right now we're trying to bring the cost down for batteries um, and in particular for uh, trucks. And then also on the hydrogen part of cost is a, a uh, barrier. So I could see the collaboration on that side. Um, and at the same time, US policies also has a big implication. Um, and if there's uh, and uh, particular uh, strength and um, standards or requirement for um, the low carbon vehicles and imports, uh, I think that could have implication for uh, the China um, and technologies. A lot of area China is actually leading in particular battery uh, and development for vehicles. So yeah, I think this is a um, particular area and that will need continual collaboration um, and other colleagues already working in the trucking sector and also uh, just on EVs. Uh, but I think the road is still pretty, the journey is pretty long and particularly for this heavy duty truck sector, which uh, is, as you saw from Nina's presentation, uh, is a big emitter, even though it has a smaller share, but uh, uh, the mission from this particular sector is uh, much bigger. And also the challenge is much uh, uh, harder as well. So yeah, so that's uh, some Great. 
Thanks, Nan, for sharing your insight. It's actually a great segue to the question that we got from Chair uh, Weissmiller. Um, he's asking overall how much of China's greenhouse gas emissions are transportation and fuel protection and refining. And follow up on that is what is the percentage of heavy duty tracking of the overall transportation uh, emissions? Nina, can I? Direct the question okay. to you. Sure. So, as I mentioned, I think currently um, transport sector share of total uh, national CO2 emissions is still quite low. It's about um, a little around 10% um, most recently. And but we do expect that to grow uh, quite significantly in the future, upwards to you know as much as 20% or more um, in 2050. Um, and then of that, uh, but of that transport sector, I think about 40% um, or so are coming from heavy duty trucks uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, it's consuming a lot more um, diesel in particular. Um, and then for the fuel refining and um, extraction, we haven't looked at it from that perspective, but that's definitely something we can follow up um, and provide an answer to. We've been mostly looking at it from the demand perspective, but we do have the data that would allow us to you know, look at it from a production perspective without allocating it back to the demand. Thank you. Great. Um, and also another question from Michael Wong, uh, not just introduced. Michael is asking why you think um, LNG plays an important role in the scenarios. Um, and, and he says the greenhouse gas uh, reduction is minimal, if at all, China relies on importing LNG. What do you think about that, Nina? Sure. So I think Mike really already kind of alluded to the answer. I mean, I think we wanted to consider LNG because it's kind of a readily available technology that would immediately reduce um, diesel consumption. So in China, there's been a lot of um, you know talk of uh, trying to peak oil as early as possible. So we were looking at it from that perspective of it offsetting diesel consumption, um, even though, as you mentioned, I think because of the higher energy intensity, the CO2 would Reductions may not really happen um, right away, um, but we do see you know it could be a transition fuel um, as China is really pushing to move away from oil, you know, dirtier fossil fuels, um, also for air quality concerns, but really to move away from um, you know oil as a dirtier fossil fuel. But I think for both diesel and also as Michael mentioned LNG, there are still important energy security implications in terms of both are quite heavily dependent on imports. And then for LNG, there's also additional need for infrastructure to bring in um, the imports as well. So that is definitely a consideration. Great. I think we are almost on top of our one hour today, um, tonight. Um, again, sincere gratitude to Nan and Nina sharing their research update with us. And lastly, I just wanna say, this is a beginning of a series of CCCI webinars. We'll have uh, more topics um, on related to carbon neutrality in the upcoming weeks and months. So stay tuned for our uh, upcoming webinars and thank you again for all your participation.